morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome all, all of you on behalf of the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre and the Malaysia Singapore Society of Australia um, to this uh, webinar, uh, uh, book launch of Charlene Chan, Dr. Charlene Chan's book on families, the state and education inequality in the Singapore city state. But before we uh, begin uh, today's proceedings, I'd like to uh, acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional uh, custodians of the land, the lands of the Gadigal peoples of the Euro nation, and acknowledge their uh, custodianship on, of this land, and to acknowledge and, uh, that we are on uh, unceded Aboriginal land, and always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Well, welcome everyone. My name is, uh, I'm Dr. Yao Tong Chia, and I am the country coordinator for Singapore for the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre. I'm also the president of the Malaysia and Singapore Society of Australia, and uh, both Siak and Masa uh, will be co-hosting this uh, event. And this is also supported by um, Coinet, Competitive and International Education uh, Group of the Sydney School of Education and Social Work, of which I'm a senior lecturer. So um, I will introduce the speakers today and then pass this uh, to the moderator. So today, the, the main person that we are uh, is uh, Dr. Charlene Chong, and we are here to, you know, to uh, is uh, to launch her book. And she adopts uh, sociological approaches to understanding inequality and social policy problems. In line with interest in integrating research policy and practice, Charlene has undertaken research in academic, think tank, and public sector contexts. Her research has been published in journals such as Journal of Education Policy, Comparative Education, and Families, Relationships, and Societies. She holds a PhD in education from the University of Cambridge and the Master of Science in Comparative and International Education from the University of Oxford. Fasa Rizvi is an Emeritus Professor of Global Studies in Education at the University of Melbourne, as well as at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's also a visiting professor at the University of uh, Turku. He has written extensively on issues of identity and culture in transnational contexts globalization and education policy, and Australia-Asia relations. His book, co-authored with Bob Lingard, Globalizing Education Policy, and I highly recommend that to, to, uh, to all of you to read this, is used widely in courses around the world. A sequel to this book, Reimagining Globalization and, and Education, is currently in print. Fasal is a fellow of Australian Acad Academy of the Social Sciences, a past editor of the journal Discourse Studies in Cultural Politics of Education and past president of the Australian Association of Research in Education. Alistair Chu, the moderator and chair for today, uh, before I go on faster, will be the discussant today. And the moderator, Alistair Chu, uh, has been teaching chemistry for nearly 30 years and came late to formal research in education. He adopts social historical approach to explore the Singapore education system and its relationships to global trends and developments, both from an embedded participant's perspective and as part of a broader historical context. Much of this research has been published as book chapters in various publications, interrogating the evolution of education in a globalizing Singaporean society. Alistair holds a master's and PhD in education from the National Institute of Education, Singapore. So I'll pass the time over to you, Alistair, to chair and moderate the proceedings. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'd just like to thank Yao Tong and the team at Sydney for helping us set this thing up. I would like to remind everyone that if you need a copy of the book, there's a discount provided thoughtfully by Rutledge. You can get 30% off with the promo code FSG30. It's uh, well worth getting a copy for yourself. Uh, I would like to say that having watched the evolution of this book, I think it's a very compelling window into the more unusual and disadvantaged sectors of Singapore society. 
It's not something you hear about in the international press a lot. So without further ado, I'd like to say that Charlene's book and the discussion that we're going to have is probably rather significant for the future of education in this region. But I'll leave you to decide how significant that is. And without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Charlene where she can elab elaborate on what that book is all about. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alistair. Um, and thanks to uh, Yao Tong um, and the Sydney Southeast Asia um, Centre and the Malaysia and Singapore Society of Australia uh, for extending this really kind invite to, to speak about my book today. Um, it really is um, a, a, a great honour to, to be here. Um, and I'm also very grateful to be joined by Alistair and, and Fazel today, two people I look up to um, intellectually and personally. Um, so really glad that you both could join us. Um, and of course, thank you all uh, very much for taking the time um, to be here today. So great to have um, all of you um, here with us. Um, so I wrote this book, Families, the State um, and Educational Inequality in the Singapore City State, um, based on some of my findings um, from my PhD at the University of Cambridge. So the book mainly is based on 72 interviews with 12 socioeconomically disadvantaged families. Um, and it focuses on how these families experience Singapore's education system. An education system, as Alistair um, alluded to, um, and a country, in fact, that's often surrounded by lots of stories of success, so much so that experiences of disadvantage and poverty, um, as some sociologists and increasingly like a wider population in Singapore are increasingly recognizing um, that experiences of disadvantage and poverty can often um, seem invisible. Um, so there are different aspects of um, this book that um, I can talk about, but I thought that the key point I thought I'd, um, uh, I'd try to get across today um, is one that I think cuts across every implication, every theme and theoretical and methodological choice in this book. Um, and that is that families' perspectives and experiences matter. Um, they can help reveal to us the successes and weaknesses of a system, and they can push us to reframe the way we think about policy issues and policy problems. Um, which in turn can affect the way we address these issues and whether we address them fairly. So before I discuss families perspectives, I'll start by introducing um, some aspects of uh, the Singapore context in which families' lives are embedded. So Singapore is a small post-colonial multiracial city-state in Southeast Asia. It's portrayed in media as a global city with a, uh, with a top performing education system according to international education benchmarking tests like PISA. Some noteworthy aspects of Singapore's governance style um, is what's often described as a strong state. Um, so critics describe it as soft authoritarian, as paternalistic, i.e. parent-like, especially regarding education. So the majority of schools in Singapore are under the general control and financing of Singapore's Ministry of Education. And historically, Singaporean politicians have emphasized that as a state with uh, little natural resources, developing human capital is absolutely vital to Singapore's survival. Um, so generally, Singapore has this anti-welfareist ideology, but education is an exception. Um, almost all schools in Singapore are heavily subsidized. Um, they're virtually free and of reasonably high quality. So while this seems to invite dependence on the state in some ways, um, they're at the same time self-responsibilizing neoliberal logics that structure Singapore's education system. So some critics suggest that the most obvious evidence of this is the ideological heart or cornerstone of Singaporean public and education policy, and that's the concept of meritocracy. So Singaporean meritocracy uh, goes something like this. Um, any individual, regardless of background, with talent and hard work can achieve education and life success. And that emphasis on individual effort and performance is reinforced through high levels of streaming and tracking and rigorous high stakes examinations in, in Singapore. But when examined closely, Singaporean meritocracy actually embodies both neoliberal and strong state logics, because it seems to work as follows. In light of high quality state provision, i.e. the dependability of the state, individuals and families can and should bear responsibility for educational and life success. And that metaphor of leveling the playing field is a pervasive one in Singapore. That is the state will provide high quality, virtually free schooling, but beyond this, and indeed because of this, you and your family need to be responsible and help yourselves. 
But in recent years, there's been growing discontent in Singapore over the unfairness of meritocracy. So research suggests persistent worsening education and socioeconomic inequalities in Singapore. For example, quantitative research suggests gaps in education attainment between those from different class and ethnic backgrounds. Mm. Um, there's growing recognition that meritocracy, as one critic puts it, favors those who already have the capital. Um, and you see that in this comic in a, from a Singapore online forum. So here you can see upper middle class families. Um, they're extensively strategizing, doing everything um, to ensure the best outcomes for their children, um, in stark contrast with the circumstances of a less advantaged family. So in light of this complex social political uh, context, that is a strong state that invites dependence in some ways, yet also promotes neoliberal self responsibilizing logics, how do disadvantaged families navigate Singapore's education policy landscape? And how do they relate to the state and state institutions as they do so? So these are some of the key questions that my book um, tries to unpack. So currently there's little research that engages the perspectives of groups on the sharp end of inequality to hear on their terms, their representations of their experiences, anxieties, and aspirations. So in December, 2016, I approached local community organizations in Singapore for help in contacting families. And after securing their approval, I sent them my criteria for disadvantaged families based on household income, parental education, and parental occupation. I focused only on students who were 16 to 17 years old and their parents or primary caregivers, um, if they were not their parents. And I only interviewed ethnic minority families. So those who self-identified as Indian or Malay. And what I found perhaps most striking from these interviews was that much research literature, especially um, UK and US based literature, portrays relationships between disadvantaged families and schools as fraught and, and uneasy, um, where ex families experience these feelings of alienation and distance and distrust. In Singapore, however, homeschool relations generally seem to be warm, close and friendly. So families deeply appreciated the schools and the state by proxy because schools were seen as the benefaction of the strong state. Um, so in the introduction of my book, I describe these warm, close relations with the school and the state uh, through the story of Anjushri's family. So I'll read an excerpt from it now. When Sanjay got caught smoking in school, his mother, Anjushri, slapped him. The whole term, Sanjay's grades had been free falling and Anjushri's anxiety was at breaking point. Anjushri cried to him, enough already, Sanjay, what happened to you? Why are you putting yourself into trouble? His teachers helped Srinivas and Anjushri in choosing an appropriate form of discipline for Sanjay. Um, so Srinivas is um, Sanjay's father. And Anjushri recalled with a laugh, Sunday Sanjay will play soccer with the church people, now canceled already. My husband said, don't go, punishment for you, few months you don't go. According to Anjushri, his teachers had called them, telling them, give him this punishment, don't let him go, and don't give him handphone a lot. There was a long list of people and systems out there that could not be trusted, Anjushri felt, particularly for low-income, uneducated families like herself. Take, for instance, her own mother who tried to cheat her out of her father's inheritance money when he died. However, the Singapore government's management of its education system was an anomaly in a dark sea of broken systems and people, and she and Srinivas gladly collaborated with teachers in overseeing and raising their children. However, not only did families appreciate the state and schools, parents and children also accepted responsibility for success. And in particular, they devolved this responsibility to young people who were seen as ultimately responsible for success. So to understand why this was the case, I drew out from the interview findings um, a, a sort of plausibility structure. So reasons why families had these warm relations with the state and school, reasons that made plausible the acceptance of responsibility. So there are two reasons um, which I'll explain in turn. So first, the competence, the perceived competence of the state and school, and second, the perceived care of the state and school. So regarding competence, so materially families felt that the state had provided schools and tuition programs that are of high quality and well-funded. So families felt that their beliefs in the competence of the state and schools were validated by what they heard in the news about Singapore's education rankings, number one in the world in science and maths and so on, um, as you can see from this quote from one mother, Hannah. <laughs> 
And this is an unsurprising finding. So Varki Foundation survey results suggest that 73% of Singaporean families felt government funded schools were good, um, significantly higher than the global average of 45%. And in contrast to this perceived competence, um, disadvantaged parents saw themselves as uneducated and less capable at child rearing and therefore felt grateful for the work of the state and the schools. So second, teachers in Singapore were seen as very caring, um, as doing all in their power to help children navigate a tough education system. As such, there was a level of trust and a relatively free flow of information between the home and the school. And children and parents consulted teachers on education and personal life matters and decisions. So these close relationships with teachers and, and school counselors and the broader school staff uh, formed an important buffer, I realized, especially for disadvantaged young people, um, given studies that suggest that disadvantaged young people experience disproportionately high rates of negative childhood experiences, for example, being bullied, having a family member in prison, and so on. And young people in particular use the imagery of friendship, even family, to discuss their relationship with teachers. Um, as you can see in this quote from one young person, um, Deepta, who describes her teachers as um, legit, our parents, um, as not judgmental and focusing on the more positive side. So the chain of reasoning uh, families described that seemed to underpin these um, warm relations with the school and the state seemed to be as follows. Families depend on the state's competence and on the care of teachers. And this dependence makes plausible for families the acceptance and devolution of responsibility to the child. So dependency as a term, it's often seen as antithetical or opposite to responsibility. It's often assumed you can't be both dependent and responsible at the same time. But my findings suggest that they work synergistically together. In fact, the context of dependency makes plausible uh, the, the um, acceptance of responsibility. And this might be interpreted as the internalization and reproduction of the key logics of Singaporean meritocracy, um, that the state has provided a sufficient dependency context, therefore you should take responsibility for your future education and uh, financial success. And we see this chain of reasoning in green here in this quote by one father, Srinivas. So when asked what he liked about Singapore's education system, um, he said, um, Singapore education-wise, what I like. First thing for education-wise, we go to our Singapore government, our members of parliament. First place, they will help you. They never say no, no such thing. For education, you go to our Singapore government, they will ask you, what? If it's regarding education, come, 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 sit down, what do you want? Other thing, the MP will say, okay, I will write a letter, wait for the reply to come. But education-wise, no such thing. No money, you don't have uniform to buy for your children, no pocket money, no shoe. No problem, they write a letter, this letter you go give to your school, you can collect these items from the school. So if the children don't wanna to listen to us, you know everything, but you don't wanna have a good life, that is up to you. You cannot blame the school, you cannot blame the parents. Everything they already give you, the decision is yours, your life. You wanna do, that is up to you. However, while families broadly accepted this chain of reasoning, there are also ways in which these relations can be experienced very differently by different families, depending on their circumstances. And that became clear to me when I visited IU's family. They were probably the most disadvantaged family I interviewed. They faced multiple intersecting disadvantages. Um, she was battling cancer. Um, they had seven children to financially support. They were living in a one bedroom rented flat and the, her husband had to drop out of work to care for the children. They were earning nearly zero dollars a month and living almost completely on welfare. And taking up educational responsibility became impossible or implausible for Kawi, Ayu's eldest son, who dropped out of school to work as a cleaner and a restaurant worker to financially support the family. And it was unsurprising that this family was less warm and less trusting in their relations with the school and the state. And what became clear to me was that if families don't find the state and school to be dependable, if that dependency context is not sufficiently robust, it can adversely affect families' willingness and their capacity to take up educational responsibility and ownership for their lives. So overall, this relation, these relations of trust, responsibility, and dependency, they differ in how they play out in the Singapore context compared to research in, in many other contexts. Um, and that's partly because of the role the state and schools play in developing relations of trust and even friendship with families. 
So one thing is that I don't want to be overly critical and pessimistic um, and see families' general positivity towards the state as purely state manipulation. Um, I think that would be to unfairly position families as dupes, as unable to critically mediate state discourse. I think there are several commendable aspects of the management of education in Singapore that facilitate genuine trust and partnership. But at the same time, I do think there is a need for policymakers and researchers to more closely interrogate the nature and effects of specific state family relations. So crucially, do these relations motivate, create opportunities for progress, or do they exact too heavy and oppressive a burden on families? And under what circumstances might these relations have, have different effects? So while the responsible self and the responsible family is a dominant recurring political trope in Singapore and in many um, advanced capitalist states, my research suggests that we need to pay more careful attention to concepts such as the plausibility of responsibility and the importance of dependency as a context for responsibility. And this seems particularly important in our hyper-competitive and individualistic age. So briefly, what might this mean for how we frame and think about policy problems? So the dominant policy problem um, with regards to disadvantaged families um, often um, seems to be, or is implied to be, how do we make these families responsible? Especially, how do we make the irresponsible poor family responsible? And that can lead to anti-welfare policies that focus on competition and self-reliance. But one might reframe the policy problem to how do we make responsibility plausible for families? And that entails different implications. For example, making support for disadvantaged families more nuanced, contextualized, and sufficient to make plausible and reasonable the uptake of responsibility. So in summary, my new book explores and discusses and advocates for the value of three things. First, the value of families' perspectives in revealing the successes and weaknesses of a system. And from this, the value of schools and teachers in the well being of disadvantaged families. And third, the value of dependency in making responsibility plausible, um, their necessary interconnectedness as part of the human condition. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much, Shadi. Your book has certainly given me a lot of food for thought, and I suspect it will give many people who study the field a lot more questions to think about. I'd like to invite uh, Fazal, who's our distinguished discussant, to elaborate on some of the points he's been thinking about with regard to the book. Well, thank you very much, um, Alistair and uh, your tongue and Charlene uh, for inviting me to say a few things. Uh, uh, I have to say that I've known about this book uh, before it became a book, uh, because on the day that uh, um, uh, Charlene uh, defended her thesis, uh, I arrived in Cambridge for a three-month uh, sabbatical, and uh, I met her examiners, the two examiners, uh, Susan Robertson and Paul Morris, and both of them are old friends of mine, and they were incredibly enthusiastic and happy having, having experienced a, a wonderful discussion with Charlene and having read the book. Uh, they came and said that normally you don't learn anything new when you examine PhD thesis, but this is a major, major exception. And indeed, uh, um, Charlene's book said lots of new things uh, that they had never considered before. So that was uh, really my first encounter with the book. And of course, since then, I have read the book. Um, now, there are, there are a number of points that I want to make, uh, but uh, the first one is, uh, that, uh, that I think uh, uh, the complex relationship between uh, trust, responsibility, and uh, dependency is something that in the literature is not adequately addressed, uh, okay? And uh, one of the most important aspects of this book uh, is uh, um, uh, Charlene's attempt to make that relationship much more complex, uh, not only in relation to the various policy generalities, but also in relation to the contextual specificities of uh, people's lives. So basically what she has taken on is, uh, if you like, the uh, abstraction of the work of the state on the one hand, and the reality of uh, the lives of the ordinary people on the other hand. This abstraction and particularity is not easy to reconcile. 
And one of the best things about this book, as far as I'm concerned, is the particular and the general, or particular and the abstract, are brought together in a beautiful uh, narrative in this book, uh, which makes it absolutely a joy to read. So you can read the book either as a complex theorizing, or you can read the book as a story of uh, disadvantaged poor people who encounter their lives in particular ways and relate to the, uh, the state in particular ways. Uh, of course, that disadvantage that, uh, that, uh, that Charlene um, um, explores um, actually has these two dimensions, uh, the ways in which the state sees it and the ways in which they see it, and what is the nature of the relationship between those two. At the same time, I think one of the things that perhaps the book does not do, and perhaps Charlene may actually look to explore a little bit more, is uh, um, the, what, 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 why has uh, and how has uh, Singapore state been able to mask poverty and disadvantage so well, okay? Why is it uh, that uh, in those flats, uh, you see the flats uh, as uh, well kept and all those other things, and you don't see what is going on inside those apartments uh, and uh, the poverty and the difficulty and the deep unhappiness uh, that uh, I think uh, is clearly present. Uh, so that uh, the issues that ought to be open in the policy space get, get masked. Now, whether that is deliberate or whether simply that's a function of the ways in which the state is organized is of course, that's something that needs to be negotiated. But the masking of disadvantage um, is if, if you like uh, something that needs to be studied. Indeed, uh, you know, on my many visits to Singapore, I have found it very difficult for people to admit that they're poor. Indeed, there is some kind of shame that is associated with being, being poor in a, or even disadvantaged. So uh, everyone feels that they have to project uh, an image of uh, Singapore to outsiders like myself who goes and visits. Uh, so this masking is something that is, I'm, I'm really quite interested in. The, the other question about uh, the masking is that the complexities of the differentiations across uh, the poor people does not come through. Even in the book, uh, the gender difference, for example, uh, between uh, single mothers who are poor and indeed uh, the families who appear must be quite profound because a single mother who is working two jobs does not have the time to look after the kids. So their engagement with the state has to be very different. So I think if you actually start differentiating and disaggregating the disadvantaged, the poor, the marginalized, then you may actually reveal some new aspects uh, that perhaps have not been incorporated in the book. Uh, okay, and I think uh, that would be a very interesting way of uh, going proceeding. I was unclear as to why it is uh, that uh, Charlene only studied the ethnic minority groups uh, and not also the Chinese group, because the contrast could have revealed something interesting about the racial politics of uh, Singapore, which of course the Singapore state does not want to publicize in any way, but it does exist nonetheless. Uh, and I think uh, trying to bring that out would have been quite interesting. The other point that I want to make that relates to that is uh, the word neoliberal gets used quite a lot. But as Iowa Ong, whose work uh, Charlene has used extensively in her thesis, uh, neoliberalism as an exception, um, points out that, uh, that Singapore is a different kind of neoliberal state. Uh, um, and indeed, it is a strong authoritarian paternalistic state. So it actually has a very different language of responsabilization than is the case, for example, in Australia or United Kingdom or any other place. In other words, the self responsabilization gets articulated and practiced in slightly different way. I noticed that in one of the slides, uh, um, is, um, 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 Charlene uses the word strong paternalistic state. And of course the term paternalistic is very deliberate, but in, I noticed that it's paternalistic 
but not maternalistic. I wonder what difference might it make if you had a maternalistic state rather than paternalistic state. That actually raises the issue of gender that I think we might want to say. Meritocracy, of course, has been the bread and butter of uh, Singapore ideology. Meritocracy is not new and is not has emerged out of neoliberal state, although a neoliberal state has kind of transformed it. But you know, if you read the speeches of Lee Kuan Yew from the 1950s and 60s, responsabilization and self-responsabilization is a key, key concept. In other words, the very formation of uh, Singapore was based upon the idea of uh, self-responsabilization, an individuality that was located within the collective, uh, collective, uh, collective formation. But nonetheless, uh, there was a huge amount of pressure that for the collective to, su to, to be successful, you have to be very, very um, mindful of your individual responsibility. In other words, collective can never be successful unless each individual is successful in terms of, and hence the meritocracy goes back to, uh, if you like, the formation of the state. And I think that would be quite an interesting way of looking at it as to how the idea of meritocracy itself has changed over time, whether the 1950s notion of the colonial or post-colonial notion of self-responsabilization is different to the current confident neoliberal state uh, notion of self-responsabilization um, and how that works. Uh, so um, um, in, in, in the 1950s and 60s, self-responsabilization was largely about national formation, about creating of the creation of the new nation. Now, it is about preserving an image of a nation that is well and truly already established. And exactly how the, uh, the notion of the practices and the thinking around and, and about meritocracy has changed, uh, that is interesting. Uh, and that is actually helpful in trying to understand how meritocracy of the contemporary kind is no longer as sustainable as was the meritocracy of Lee Kuan Yew. Lee Kuan Yew was a collective a group project, building of a nation. Now it is a very different kind of meritocracy that you are looking at, uh, which actually is not about state formation, but state maintenance, state preservation, and state enhancement, and state image, and all those other things. So the confidence that Singapore has achieved in the in the in the in the geopo geopo geopolitical sense has an effect on the ways in which uh, I think the meritocracy has been uh, in interpreted. Of course, now we know that the unequal space is uh, is 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 the is is there, and meritocracy in an unequal space is much difficult, much more difficult to achieve. And I think that raises the question as to the masking of poverty that I re referred to. So if it continues to be masked, uh, then the, 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 the dissatisfaction with meritocracy would simply be internalized, okay, by people, by people, and thereby adding to the disadvantage, adding to the feelings that you are not uh, quite uh, uh, doing your job as far as uh, Look, be looking after your kids and all those sort of things concerned. So I think there are a number of issues that, uh, um, that, are, that are raised uh, in this particular, the complex relationship between dependency, responsibility, and, uh, and trust is uh, a changing one, okay? The collective project that was the Singapore uh, in 1960s is a very different kind of collective project of the 2020s. Okay, and I think if we can actually um, sort of trace, uh, and this uh, will bring in somebody like your tongue as a historian who can, who can and not a sociologist like Charlene, if you can trace the changes, then I think it raises some more new questions for sociologists like uh, Charlene to, 
to, to take up and take it further. In other words, uh, if your tongue can do the historical labor then uh, and pass on the baton to Charlene, then Charlene can make her sociological analysis even more complex and even more helpful to policymakers and others. I think I might finish off there. Thank you very much, Alistair and Charlene, for a wonderful, wonderful book. And, uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me to say a few things about it. Thank you very much, Fazal. That's a very enlightening perspective. I'd like to invite Charlene to respond. Specifically, I'd like her to talk a bit more about meritocracy and also about some of the, um, when people write a book, there's always some background stuff that got left out. So I suspect Charlene has lots of left out material that she might like to tell us about. Charlene? Yeah, thanks so much, Basil, for those um, really kind and um, insightful uh, words. Um, and thanks, Alistair, as well. Um, yeah, lots in there. Um, I think um, with regards to, I'll start with what's what might not be in the book, so like what's left out, as Alistair said, um, and as Basil pointed out, like race and gender, I think are two um, aspects that I think could be made more of in, in future work. Um, yeah, and that differentiation of experience. So I think in, in, um, in this book, and I think in this talk as well, I tried to present what was, what I felt like was the most striking finding that seemed to cut across most of the findings um, across in interview transcripts. Um, yeah, but I do think that, um, yeah, we could look more at the differentiation of experience um, between um, different groups based on um, race and gender and so on. Um, so with, with regards to gender, um, yeah, I think that's that's right. That most that perhaps the most disadvantaged are those who are single mothers and and poor. Um, and um, they and I, I think like yeah, one of the hardest things about yeah, I should also mention I think one of the hardest things about doing this kind of research about family life and experience is kind of delimiting the scope of it. Um, yeah, aspects that I think we can do more in terms of future work. Um, so just in terms of gender, um, and in terms of single mothers specifically. I think so. There's been a rising number of marital dissolutions in in Singapore um, over the past decade. I think the increase was something like forty six percent between two thousand and twenty thirteen, um, and and of course, like um, families who have lost uh, their fathers to um, to sickness and um, and death and so on. But I'll talk about two mothers who who come to mind um, who I interviewed for this study. So one was Dania. Um, who she, so she was in the middle of processing divorce with um, a divorce with um, uh, and she was in the middle of um, processing divorce and court proceedings um, and she talked about being worked off her feet that she had a full-time job as a cleaner she was taking care of children and housework she was filling in endless forms for her four children um, to get financial assistance from the government for them and then there's another mother Juliana who had been divorced for a few years already um, and actually didn't get to interview her because she was so busy and so tired. Um, she was working as a nurse in a private aged care facility. Um, and her grandmother, sorry, her so Juliana's mother, um, so um, the child's grandmother was the main, um, the primary caregiver for that child. Um, and I actually didn't get to interview Juliana because she was so busy and um, she didn't have time to come for this interview. So I think that silence speaks in itself, right? So like that silence of like not having that perspective um, in there. Um, I think it's interesting to think about those silences and what that tells us about inequality in Singapore. So definitely room in there for further uh, further work. Um, yes, I mean, so that's one thing that I would say about gender. But the other thing I would also say is that I think for the families that were living together, so where the parents were living together, the effects of gender seemed less stark um, in a way because of the um, high cost of living in Singapore. So both parents were um, uh, or were working in order to earn that dual income. Um, so mothers sometimes tended to work and fathers tended to help at home as well. And the division of labor was sometimes more by educational um, level than um, by gender. So for example, in the family of Omar and Nasifa, um, Omar, the father, had a very active role to play. Um, he, was, uh, he, had, he, he was more highly educated than his wife, and he was more attentive to his children's um, education um, than Nasifa, um, according to his wife, Nasifa. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think it varies. Experience of disadvantage does vary between families and families' experience, um, and drawing out the heterogeneity um, is something that future work could do. 
Um, and Alistair, you mentioned meritocracy. Um, what, what, what would be the specific question there around meritocracy? I think you're on mute, Alistair. I was wondering actually about uh, how, as Fazal says, meritocracy has evolved, has changed in the Singaporean con context so that perhaps what the parents are seeing and what the children are seeing might be a different kind of meritocracy psychologically and in practice. So perhaps you can say a bit about that and uh, also how self-help groups and the government either contribute to that or undermine that or, or change the whole discussion. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think it, I think it, that's that's interesting. I think some write that the core of meritocracy hasn't changed very much, um, but they've been at least at the rhetorical level, um, and I think to some extent at the policy level as well. Like attempts to soften meritocracy. They talk about meritocracy shifting slightly left of center. I think one critic wrote about that as well, um, especially following the twenty eleven uh, yeah twenty eleven general elections where the PAP. Um, didn't get as many votes as they expected to. Um, so I think there was a, a kind of policy system shift um, there um, as well. And I think there's talk around like creating a more compassionate meritocracy in Singapore. So trying to shift with the time. So as inequality, socioeconomic inequalities widen, and I think as recognition around that um, gradually um, increases in Singapore, there have been attempts to soften meritocracy, um, so to speak. So I think that's one um change um, and i think in terms of families experiences so while they were generally positive about the state and the school i think you kind of see children the, the the younger people so the secondary four age students um having some kind of doubt sometimes about the efficacy of the meritocracy mechanism so sometimes i think they were kind of more conscious of social realities like credential inflation um, and graduate unemployment. Um, so these are kind of like increasing social political realities in, um, in Singapore that I think that their parents didn't experience so much when they were growing up in um, like 1960s, 70s, 80s Singapore, which was kind of rapidly industrializing. Um, opportunity structures were rapidly expanding. Economic growth was fast. Um, but I think now, you know, that things are things are different in Singapore and this growing awareness of um, inequality. But I'll just quickly say something about masking as well. So I think public housing, I think one thing that's interesting about Singapore is the extent of public housing in Singapore. And um, they've managed to achieve something like 88% of their resident population has um, lives in their own, own like they, they have house ownership. Um, and I think that's on the one hand really great that people have shelter, um, but on the other hand, I think that can also be a masking um, mechanism um, that, you know, that, so that when, when, when say people who come and visit Singapore, they don't see, um, uh, they don't see poverty so much because it's kind of kept behind um, the doors of, of a public housing flat. Can I actually ask uh, in another question, Alistair? Um, the, the, there are three groups of people that are most visible as far as disadvantaged population to an outsider to Singapore, um, like visitors who goes there for a week at most, you know, often less time, you know, but on a regular basis. One is, uh, is uh, young mothers quite often, okay, with children in tow. The other one is very old people, retired people who are still working, okay? And the third one is, of course, uh, migrant labor, okay? Uh, those three groups uh, are the most visible. Of course, I mean, um, as, I, as you pointed out, there is a huge amount of disadvantage that in the flats behind the closed door, so to speak. Uh, I was wondering actually whether the intergenerational issues uh, featured in your research, uh, um, you know, or, or in your data collection, where grandfather was there to look after the child with a very different orientation to uh, the ways in which uh, they view Singapore and Singapore state than the younger people do, you know? And I, I, I'm just wondering whether that's something that emerged in your research. Yeah, absolutely. I think they were even more positive than the parents were 
Mm -hmm. So I think, so they were growing, so they were kind of in Singapore in the 1960s, um, 70s, and um, yeah, and, and, and they saw Singapore transition from um, a um, fishing village um, mm -hmm. to like a, you know, to, to a modern industrialized um, city. Um, and they, um, and they compared with what they saw in the broader region um, in Malaysia, um, in India, where some of these um, families um, had uh, migrated from, um, and they made these comparisons. Um, so I think, I think that I think the history and the comparative imaginary um, came together to, um, and also I think the economic opportunity. So the structural um, also all came together to create for grandparents. I think if anything. Um, an even stronger perception of um, how competent and caring the Singapore um, state was. I think that uh, the modern Singapore state uh, currently anyway in the age of COVID has sort of hit a perceptual plateau. It doesn't look so much, in fact, in most e developing economies and developed economies, it doesn't look so much as if we're going forward and that might have some impact on the perceptions of the young. Um, some of the questions that we are getting are very interesting and I'll surface them later. But uh, I'd like to ask Fazal also whether he sees uh, generalizability to other places in the Asia Pacific that he has awareness of. Mm. I think that's an interesting question actually, because uh, um, I've been thinking about that, you know, with the extent to which uh, the kind of insights that are being presented uh, okay, um, are applicable. I think they're partially a, a, applicable to Mal Malaysia and uh, lesser extent into Indonesia, but there are additional factors in Malaysia and, uh, and, and Indonesia and even Brunei, you know, um, um, wh which, which, which do not, uh, which, which is, which is it's not, it's not helpful to actually generalize from Singapore case. Singapore at one level actually presents itself as a, almost a unique um, space uh, in the country. I work quite a bit in Finland, you know, where there is simple, similar kind of, um, but you know, meritocracy works very, very differently in Finland to the ways in which uh, uh, it works in Singapore. Si si Singapore's post-colonial history, okay, of growing so rapidly and so 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 out of uh, fishing village, as uh, Charlene pointed out, you know, barely 60 years ago, barely 50 years ago you know, to now, actually uh, sort of uh, represents a very, very different kind of self-perception and self-image of yourself, you know. And I'm not surprised that older people, even as they're not being looked after all that well, you know, and I see a lot of uh, poor people in the streets uh, in, uh, in, in Singapore now than I did, uh, did uh, even 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So I don't know what's happening, but I certainly see poor people. You know, I, I have no idea actually what it is that they are thinking about while they are confident about Singapore for the newer generation, whether they are also confident about Singapore, about themselves and its capacity to look after them. You know, that's unclear to me. So as a result of this historical recency and its rapid development, marks Singapore out as really distinctive. And of course, its size too. It's barely 5 million people, you know, compared to other countries, which are much larger, where the state has not been as coherent and as consistent as uh, it has been. I mean, if you look at, uh, look at, look at Sing Malaysia, there've been all kinds of problems about uh, the, you know, uh, political problems, whereas there's been a kind of stability, you know, perhaps an achievement of Lee Kuan Yew, I don't know, you know, that has been really quite remarkable and quite interesting. And that stability has allowed people to imagine the state or imagine the nation in ways that are very different to other nations, uh, you know, like, like, uh, like Indonesia, for example, which had the military state of one time, and then other states and other endogenous pressures make them very, very different. Uh, um, there are lots of states that want to emulate Singapore, but they do not have the Singapore's distinctive history of economic progress and economic achievement to draw upon to legitimize their claims to meritocracy in a way that uh, Singapore can. Singapore can actually tell people the meritocracy story, 
in a way that is much more convincing to the people and the citizens than it is the case with other country because it has been consistently successful and consistently raised living standards even as people have a, a large number of people have remained poor so i think i think comparisons with singapore are really really difficult to make I could add to that. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree, Fazal. I mean, I think the context of the history, politics, and the culture of, of Singapore is um, really quite unique. Um, I think if there's one thing that could be um, uh, generalizable, so to speak, analytically, I suppose, um, is um, I'm thinking about the last point that I made um, in the talk around the value of dependency and making plausible responsibility um, and their interconnectedness as part of the human condition. Um, and I think that chain of reasoning between dependency and responsibility, these are not anti um, but that they need to work synergistically together to make responsible responsibility plausible. Um, I think that's one thing that um, other contexts <laughs> could um, could consider and think about more. So my next uh, question before we open up and have a look at some of the interesting questions the audience has provided is if the ideological and political stability forms part of the plausibility scenario, the background, so to speak. Then the next thing is, what specific policy implementations do you think will add to, policy, to plausibility going forward, practical plausibility, that people actually believe, I can do this, I can get this done, and this will help my future? Um, can I actually just, because I've been thinking about it, um, there, are, there are three aspects to the state's uh, ability to make itself convincing, you know, make sure that crises don't emerge. Okay, the three aspects are, uh, are rationality, legitimacy, and motivation. You know, uh, Singapore has presented itself as a rational technocratic state. Okay. In other words, there are a whole range of instruments that are all around the place, uh, you know, in a small country like Singapore, that has made sure that there is no rationality crisis. Okay. That rationality is more or less insured. Uh, and that has led to a degree of legitimacy that is much greater than it is in many other countries. And that has led people to be motivated to be able to deliver in turn on the rationality and the legitimacy. So if you like, if you draw a circle and have these three things as legitimacy, motivation, more, and, uh, and, 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 and rationality as three aspects, they're feeding off each other, you know, and they're trying to make uh, the nation strong, you know, in terms of believability and the plausibility of the meritocracy narrative. Now, what happens, of course, is, uh, and we saw that in the last election, is uh, that state can actually do its rationality and its technocracy, uh, overdo it, you know, and, and thereby raise the specter of contradictions between meritocratic language and the actual experiences of poverty and disadvantage. And if that contradiction gets bigger and bigger, then legitimacy disappears, okay, and motivation disappears and rationality disappears. So I think that's actually what the Singapore state has to be careful of, is how do we keep people believing in the legitimacy of the state, okay, and therefore motivated, and therefore regarding the system as rational and technocratically in, in their favor. So I think, I think it's really, really interesting as going forward, because I can actually feel, and I think, uh, number of other people have written on that, is that there is element of, uh, of, of dis, de, de, inst, dis, de, uh, destabilization of uh, legitimacy, okay? And that's why the party lost uh, some support, you know? And uh, that could become a lot more extensive. And therefore, it could have the kind of political problems that it has, relative, it has succeeded in, in avoiding for the last 60 years or so, you know? I mean, um, so it's at the cusp of uh, making sure that the legitimacy of the state is maintained and uh, the, the contradictions are somehow dealt with and addressed. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think it'll be interesting to think about uh, political stability um, with um, in the context of 
the coronavirus pandemic, um, I mean, I, I think the first thing that came to mind when I um, heard about Singapore moving to home-based learning was that a lot of these families um, were living in um, such tight quarters. Um, and one of the reasons why they were so positive about schools and state was because, you know, schools provided a space, like a physical space for kids to be in. Um, and so they could do their homework there sometimes and then come home. Um, and I just thought of the difficulty of doing um, schooling at home for a lot of these families who are living in such cramped condition, like a family of nine living in a one bedroom flat um, and the digital divide as well, which I think um, there's been quite a bit of Singapore news commentary around that. So it'll be interesting to think about political stability and how that um, shifts in the context of the pandemic um, going forward. Um, and with regards to the question around um, policy implications. So I think the main thing with this work is um, trying to push for a mindset shift um, so that the instead of starting, when we think about policy, instead of starting from the responsible citizen as the desired endpoint, um, start with thinking about making responsibility plausible. So that context of dependency um, and yeah, starting from there rather than at the point of trying to responsibilize. Um, yeah, I think in terms of policy implications, um, I think one thing I was thinking about um, was around a professional well-trained school workforce. Um, I think that was one of the main things that families spoke a lot about with the professionalism um, and the care of, of teachers and the broader school staff um, in Singapore. Um, I think maintaining that um, and uh, continuing to improve in that is one of the implications, but I expand more in terms of policy implications in the book. One of the things historically that uh, is of note is that in three years time, Singapore will have reached its 60th birthday. So in three years time, where do you see these families going, Charlene? Do you think that Singapore will be intervening in specific ways? I mean, I'm asking you to open up a crystal ball here, but uh, I know that's not your job, but it's a good thing to perhaps take a look at. Mm. Yeah, and Fazal, if you wanted to help me with this crystal ball, I'm like, um, <laughs> feel free. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think that the pandemic will, um, I think, well, that is kind of making me think, like, how do these relations of responsibility and dependency, how will that change, um, especially with the, um, with the pandemic? Um, and it, it would definitely be interesting to do a follow up in, in three years time and see um, yeah, to see what these families are thinking and feeling. Um, yeah, especially in the context of like possible even economic instability that comes with, with the pandemic. Um, yeah, Fazil, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think the pandemic is, uh, I mean, we don't know actually how mm. its consequences is going to be felt, you know, because uh, uh, up until now, people have been behind closed doors. But when they come out, if you like, uh, how they're going to relate to the state and state institutions, including state, remains to be seen. You know, and I think uh, a project in three years' time would be really quite uh, appropriate to do. My own view is that uh, that uh, there is quite a lot of um, hidden disillusionment that is building. You know, and uh, Singapore state has one of two options: one, become even more authoritarian. In order to, in order to, in order to tone down, you know, in order to suppress um, um, dissatisfaction. On the other hand, do something about the dissatisfaction, you know. And I suspect uh, it's going to be something of the combination of both in three years' time, you know, where they will try to um, try to suppress uh, dissatisfaction and also do something about it at the same time, you know. Um, now, um, since. My own view, one of the things that I keep on thinking about in relation to Singapore is uh, uh, Singapore's responsabilization idea has, was really built on a logic of nation building, okay? Now we are looking at a nation built, okay? In other words, in past tense. So you cannot use the rhetoric of national building in the same way as Lee Kuan Yew he was able to do it, okay? to make sure that people are responsible. And I'm really interested in the ways in which uh, the dynamic of 
nation changing itself uh, is communicated to the people and how people are brought in to understand that they still have a role to play in building of the nation, you know, and not assuming that the state already exists in its completed form, okay? And uh, I, I think that's where the em problems are going to emerge, where people sort of saying, you promised us all this, okay? And we worked very hard, you know, to deliver the state that you promised us, okay? But now, 60 years later, there are a large number of people who don't feel that the promises have been delivered on. And that raises the problem of legitimacy. That raises the problem of motivation. Mm, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's quite critique around policy. Sorry, I know we're coming up to time, um, but I think like there's a lot of critique around policy in Singapore sometimes being quite blunt in terms of welfare provision and so on. So I think one of the key arguments of this book is that it needs to be more nuanced, more contextualized as inequalities widen um, in, in Singapore. There needs to be attention paid to um, how do we make policy more nuanced and contextualized so that we are um, appropriately providing for um, different groups as circumstances change. We have time for one last uh, question, perhaps. I would like to ask about uh, your research in Singapore as you were talking about the various means in which disadvantaged families received help from the government. Um, what about the self-help groups and other para-governmental organizations? How did you see these as having a role? Hmm. Um they from what i saw like they that i think i think it was interesting i think families sometimes saw self help group organizations as part of the state um and they felt like the kind of provisions that they were making like self help groups were making was um something that they really appreciated like i think so self, a lot of them went to self help group tuition programs um, and um and camps and so on even parenting classes some of these self help groups ran parenting classes as well and parents were like these are really useful they teach you what to feed the child like boil the egg don't fry the egg for instance um and so they they expressed a lot of appreciation for for self help groups and i think that was part of the feeling of um the state's competent and the state's caring it's an interesting question, actually, because, uh, you know, when you're looking at self group help group, it's not only those groups that have been created, but also there are a large number of NGOs, church groups and philanthropic group. So, for example, the Tamil families that I know, OK, uh, quite often rely not only on the state, but on the temple you know, and uh, the ways in which temple might support them. And I suspect that's the same with Malays and, and uh, Muslims uh, and perhaps even the Chinese group or Christians, uh, you know, who go to the church. And of course, uh, I, I do know that there are philanthropic groups that are emerging in, uh, in Singapore where the corporate responsibility is to help the poor and all those sort of things. Uh, exactly how all that is working was not and could not have been part of uh, part of Charlene's work. But I think that's another particular uh, notion: is how does the the uh, IG sorry governmental organization and non-governmental organizations work together, and what are the what are the differing uh, expectations? of the, the state as opposed to non-state actors. I'd like to perhaps close this segment by saying uh, that in Singapore, many of these self-help groups and independent groups, uh, there's this lurking feeling in Singapore that everything behind the scenes is government, mm -hmm. that it's also government policy to get people to help each other. So I don't know how we're ever going to get out of this, but. Thank you very much, Charlene, for lifting the log and looking underneath and, and really surfacing very important questions for Singapore in its future. And thank you so much, Fazal, for being so incisive and drawing on your vast experience to, to poke the log harder, so to speak. Thank you so much for taking part in all of this. I'm, I think that our audience has had their questions answered, and I'm very glad to be on the same stage as it were with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks, Alistair, and thanks, Basil. Thank you very much.